Thank you very much, uh, Amara, for inviting me. And uh, it's lovely to have some of Winifred's family here this afternoon as well. Winifred Lamb was elected a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries on the 25th of February 1932. Um, the blue paper is over on the table there, but the reason was uh, she's devoted to, to the study of classical antiquities and prehistoric archaeology of Greek lands. She conducted excavations at Thermae in Lesbos and made journeys of exploration in Greece. So that's the reason she was elected. Her first recorded visit to this very room um, was in December 1922 to hear the director of the British School at Athens speak about the work at Mycenae. Winifred confided to her diary, good lecture, but badly delivered. <laughs> so I feel I'm a little bit in uh, Winifred's um, shadow at the moment. She was born in November 1894 at Holly Lodge, Camden Hill, the former home of Lord Macaulay. Her father Edmund was a colliery owner and racehorse trainer and her mother Mabel was from the Winkworth family of Manchester cotton mill uh, owners. Catherine Winkworth, the hymn translator, may be known to some of you, she's a relation. Winifred was educated at home before being admitted to Newnham College, Cambridge in 1913 to read classics, and one of her contemporaries was Dorothy Garrett. Winifred was influenced at Cambridge by Jane Harrison and A.B. Cook, but unlike her male contemporaries, her interest in prehistory was not fostered by Sir William Ridgway, as he banned her from his lectures. Uh, not because she was a woman, as sometimes has been suggested, but because she was a member of the Union of Democratic Control. As the daughter of an MP, she was considered trustworthy. Sorry, that was my cheap joke. Um, <laughs> She was invited to join Room 14, the Naval Intelligence Department at the Admiralty, and joined a group of talented individuals who were working on deciphering German naval codes. Among her contemporaries were the Knox brothers, as well as the future Lincoln Professor of Classical Archaeology, John Beasley. Indeed, Winifred's diaries reveal that she frequently joined Beasley in attending sales, and they presented an attic black-figured amphora to the Ashmolean Museum, the one on the right of the screen. The one on the left, Winifred bought uh, and then presented to the Fitzwilliam herself. At one of these wartime sales, Winifred was introduced to Sidney Cockrell, director of the Fitzwilliam Museum, and she was invited to work in a voluntary capacity on the labels for the antiquities galleries. This in turn led to the invitation to be honorary keeper of Greek antiquities at the Fitzwilliam, an unpaid post that she held for nearly 40 years. Winifred's election as a fellow of the society reflected the role she developed in Greece following the First World War. In the autumn of 1920, she was admitted as a student of the British School at Athens. Um, here is the director's house. And there were other women who were admitted at the same time. And this is a, a tweet from the British School at Athens with Winifred in the middle, flanked by May Herford, and uh, on the right, Lillian Chandler. She um, sent regular letters home, and this is a sketch from one of the letters home to her mother, showing um, the keeper, Kayopi, um, of the British School on the right, greeting um, a party of students, uh, including May Her Herford and uh, Chandler, uh, coming along, and notice the uh, tennis rackets uh, as a frieze along the bottom. The women at the British School Athens had regular walks round Attica 
And there's a particularly poignant moment when they stood on the Soros, the great mound at Marathon on Armistice Day 1920. The battlefield of Marathon we saw rather early. It was grey, a rather cold day, and the Soros was extraordinarily impressive. One wanted to be able to take off one's hat like a man. Herford had lost her mountaineering brother Siegfried and Winifred five cousins during the course of the First World War. And later in the academic year, the British school was to unveil its memorial to former students who'd been killed in the conflict. Winifred's assigned topic for her year related to the frescoes from Mycenae. Here are um, some of the watercolours that were done for the publication. In May 1921, she joined the British school team excavating at Mycenae under the direction of Alan Wace and Carl Blagan of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. This was a major change in British practice as women had not been encouraged to join excavations. Indeed, J.P. Drope's newly published Cambridge University Press Handbook of Archaeological Excavations, 1915, drew attention to the perceived difficulties of allowing women to join a dig. Herford was amused by what she called Drope's Seventh. Uh, it was named after the concluding chapter of his book, which was seen as a high spirit high-spirited and energetic, even if well-mannered attack on the presence of women, or rather ladies, at a dig. Drope's discomfort appears to have been prompted by the presence of Dorothy Lamb, no relation but uh, another Newnham classicist, with whom Drope had worked on the British School excava excavation at Philocopy on the island of Milos. At Mycenae, Winifred was put in principal charge of the excavation of the palace, finding further fragments of the frescoes. So here's the palace and the um, terrace system. And here's the plan that came out of her excavations with some of the uh, frescoes that actually fitted finds that had been made at the site by Zuntas and Schliemann. In June 1923, the British School at Athens made a decision to stop the work at Mycenae and to return to the historical site of Sparta, where work had been conducted prior to the First World War. The results at Mycenae have exceeded all expectations. The managing committee of the school feel that the time has now come for taking up a site with more classical associations and Sparta, the largest and most important site in Greece yet undertaken by British excavators, naturally suggested itself as offering the opportunity of obtaining further information on the history and art of this famous city. The new director, Arthur Woodward, had worked at Sparta in the previous campaign under Richard M. Dawkins. Percy Gardner, the then Lincoln professor in Oxford stressed the importance of Sparta. When we consider what Sparta stood for in the ancient world as the great nurse of military discipline, manly virtue, and frugal self-sacrifice in the interest of one's country, we shall feel that the opportunity becomes a privilege and an honor. The renewed focus was to be on the theater, shown here on the right, and this aspect was of particular interest to Gardner following his brother's controversial study of the theatre at Megalopolis. Winifred joined the excavation in the spring of 1924, working alongside Margaret Hobling of Somerville, Oxford, the co-director of the excavations. Two other women were part of the team, Ursula Hunt of Bedford College, who was working on the inscriptions, and Elaine Tankard, one of Drope's uh, students from Liverpool, who was preparing the illustrations. Winifred found the arrangements unsatisfactory and indicated she was going to leave, but Woodward assigned her to a new area of excavations on the Acropolis. This was a turning point, and she confided to her mother, 
I've learnt enough to run a dig of my own. In fact, many sorts of digs, including the kinds not illustrated at Mycenae. I've enjoyed unearthing archaic objects of great charm and beauty. She was invited to publish the small bronzes from the excavations, here a selection. And then this work was conducted alongside the preparation for her volume, Greek and Roman Bronzes, as well as the development of the collection of Greek and Etruscan bronzes in the Fitzwilliam. And this is one of the bronzes she purchased in 1933 on the Athens market. Members of the British school had been involved in the recording of archaeological remains during the campaign in Macedonia during the First World War. Walter Hurtley, who had himself served with the East Lancashire Regiment in Macedonia, worked with Winifred at Mycenae and had then in turn invited her to join his excavations in Macedonia in the early spring of 1925. Winifred was in charge of surveying. The conditions were harsh and Winifred commented wryly, I am no colder in bed than I have often been at Cambridge. Less so in fact, because I take off very little and put on lots more. She later joined Hurtley for his excavation at Saratse in the spring of 1929. This is actually Winifred's plan of that site. But she then started to look for her own excavation. She conducted a test excavation at Methymna on the island of Lesvos in the autumn of 1928, but there was little stratigraphy and the site was abandoned. And this is one of the finds from that excavation at Methymna, now in the Fitzwilliam, a bit of Roman uh, second century pottery. But she walked um, large parts of Lesvos with her contemporary Richard Hutchinson. If you want to see his signature, it's on her blue paper. And they were looking for a prehistoric site. They came to the site of Thermi, which is there, up here, on the east coast. Let me just read from her diary. Then the weather broke. Next day, torrents of rain. We took the post bus to a place called Thermi, the last possible place, where there was a river, a great bay, and other things associated with prehistoric settlements. The rain was clearing, and when, when we got out of the car, we looked to the coast, and I said, it does look rather like a little mound, but perhaps it's natural. And the squire, in other words, Hutchinson, said, it isn't much smaller than the one at Mully. So we went to the place indicated. It was at the edge of the sea and we walked at the water's edge because there was a section cut by the sea. Yes, a few potsherds, indefinite. So it must have been inhabited. What about this sherd? Rather early, surely, and that handmade. Then the plums began to show in the slice of cake and it goes on in that vein. Oops. The formal excavations were started in April 1929 and continued to 1933. Her excavation team included two women, Nina Six from Amsterdam and Jean Mitchell from Newnham, who was in charge of making the plans for the site. One of the men, William Cuttle of Downing, had excavated with Winifred at Sparta and in Macedonia. Lesvos at this time was faced with overcrowding from refugees who'd fled from Anatolia following the destruction of Smyrna. And Winifred employed refugees as part of her workforce to clear the site. The dig was not without drama. On Friday, we had a dramatic arrest on the dig. My oldest and most obstinate workman, a delightful rascal called Mihali. The policeman, rifle in one hand and a spray of flowers in the other, came up to ask me if I would mind his arresting M. The squire and I agreed that the police would find that they'd bitten off more than they could chew. And sure enough, that afternoon, M reappeared, very pleased with himself and more willful 
than, uh, um, than ever. The final excavation report published by Cambridge University Press appeared in 1936, just two years after the final study season. Alan Wace, Winifred's colleague from Mycenae, reviewed Lamb's excavation report in the TLS. The excavation itself was conducted on strict scientific principles and Miss Lamb and her helpers are to be congratulated on the archaeological asceticism which has enabled her to publish this unprejudiced record of the objects as they were found. All possible details were observed and properly recorded and it may be said at once that the work was done as well as it could be done. Winifred started to reflect on what she had achieved on Lesbos. Nearly 5,000 years ago, adventurous colonists from the Anatolian mainland crossed the narrow straits and built there a town which it was my business to excavate. Its narrow streets, its primitive houses with their hearths and cooking utensils and other relics of an intense and busy life were uncovered by the picks and shovels of workmen from Thermi and the neighbourhood. Thus we became well acquainted and various small dramas enlivened their days and mine played against a background of prehistory. Before many weeks had passed, I realised that, while those long dead townsfolk kept my head busy, the modern villagers, intensely alive, had found a place in my heart. She then turned to the island of Chios and in 1934 excavated the sanctuary of Apollo Phanaios, Akatophana, a site excavated at the start of the First World War. Winifred loved the work there. This is the coolest and most private camp I have had under olives with oleander close by, a north wind blowing, cool and rather invigorating. The political situation in Greece, and specifically the islands in 1935, meant that it was difficult to continue the work there. In April of that year, she turned her attention to the uplands of Western Anatolia, looking for a site to excavate. Turkey was being transformed by Kemal Ataturk, and Winifred was following in the footsteps of other pioneering women, Gertrude Bell, and two former Newnham students, Margaret Hardy, and Dorothy Lamb. Moreover, the American Hetty Goldman and a team of largely women excavators were operating in Silesia. Winifred rose to the challenge. She wrote home, I'm so happy. Turkey is the land of my dreams. I must transfer all my activities here. It's vast, unexplored, with all the joys one used to have in Greece before Greece was spoiled. I get on very well with the Turks. It's marvellous to have archaeology of the type I excel in. Winifred selected the site of Kasura for her excavations with two main seasons in 36 and 37. Here's the site up here. Among her team was her colleague from Thermi, Nina Six, and also Rachel Clay, um, later, of course, Rachel Maxwell Hislop. Of course, we've just heard about her working at Maiden Castle. A report on the excavation was presented at the Antiquaries in February 1937. And during the excavation, Winifred wrote a fictional short story, The Inspector Interferes, in which she presented herself as the thinly disguised Miss Nancy Wood. She talks about Mustafa, the government inspector, who um, makes a comment on the role of women in Turkey. A few feet away, Sultan, the girl who washed the potsherds, squatted in the dry grass, waiting for the next basket, which was due as soon as the workmen should have finished digging the exciting ashy stratum in a neighbouring test pit. Modern progress, said Mustafa to himself, has unfortunately not yet reached our peasant women. But actually it had touched Sultan's feet, which were encased in large men's shoes from Czechoslovakia, 
whereas her body was still dressed in the traditional Turkish manner and her hair was very unprogressive indeed. The excavations made Winifred an authority on Anatolian archaeology. During the Second World War, she worked for the BBC on Turkish language broadcasts and monitoring, one of the key elements in keeping Turkey at best neutral. She was able to comment. It is evident that the BBC Turkish service is very widely listened to and that it has considerable influence as a source of information. Moreover, it's greatly preferred by Turks to the Turkish service from Zisan and is incomparably more popular than that from Rome. In October 1944, sorry, I should have put this up for Kasura, um, Rachel Maxwell Hislop is um, sitting here on the right and here is Winifred uh, with her Turkish team. In October 1944, um, Winifred was badly injured when a V-1 rocket hit her lodgings. At the end of the war, she worked alongside John Garstang to set up the British Institute of Archaeology at Ankara, originally to be named the Anglo-Turkish Institute of Archaeology. And she served on its committee as its honorary secretary until 1957. What were Winifred's legacies? First was the encouragement of other women in joining archaeological excavations. Among them was Emily Haspels from the University of Utrecht, Nina Six from Amsterdam, Rachel Maxwell Hislop, and various women from Newnham College. Secondly, there was the establishment of the British Institute of Archaeology at Ankara after the Second World War that drew on Winifred's work with the Turkish language section of the BBC. And third, the significant development of the Greek collection at the Fitzwilliam Museum. Winifred transformed the collections by her strategic acquisitions, notably in Greek bronzes and Athenian figure-decorated pottery. Any of these three areas made her worthy of election as a fellow of this society. Thank you.